An irrigation system like this is a beautiful sight to see. It is an integral part of modern farming and how we continue to farm throughout the year by being able to provide water to our crops and stay in production. But apart from all of the gadgets and the pipes and all of that, you need a place to store water. For a place like Chimwemwe, we need a large amount of water to be stored. And for that, we need something like this. On this video, we're going to be talking about this irrigation water reservoir. But we'll start by talking about irrigated farming. What is irrigated farming? I'll then share with you our journey as Mondo Farms to how we came from plastic tanks to building these large water reservoirs of this type. And finally, I'm going to share with you the journey and show you exactly how we build something like this. Stay with us. Greetings from the farm. I hope you're well. My name is Chisha Folatia. It's been a while, but it's so good to have you back with us again here on the Mondo Farms channel. As I said before, we're going to be talking about this irrigation water reservoir. We've just finished this here at Kimberley, and it is our first one as we continue to establish this farm. It's exactly the same type as the ones that we've been building at Winterthorn since 2021. And over the years, we've had a lot of requests asking us, how do you put up these water reservoirs? So as we were building this one, we documented the process and we're going to be able to share all the steps with you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So all crops need water to grow, right? So crop farming can be broken down into two simple types. Number one is rain-fed farming. And that is when a farmer relies on rain and other forms of precipitation to provide water to his crops. Here in Zambia, rain-fed farming normally happens during what we call the rain season, which is from about October, November to round about March, April although climate change is changing things. More on that later. And number two is irrigated farming, meaning that we provide water to our crops through various ways and means and through a number of methods. Humans have been doing irrigated crop farming since the dawn of civilization and there's so many different types. I'm not gonna go into them in this video, but if you want us to do a video on irrigation, then you can put that in the comment below. The main advantage of irrigated farming is that it allows us to be able to keep in production, not just when the rain is falling, but crops can be planted throughout the year. And basically that's what keeps humanity alive. We cannot depend on the rains. Irrigated farming is also what is going to allow humanity to survive the challenges that will come from climate change in the years to come. That is because farmers can keep applying water to their crops even as rain patterns become more unpredictable and unreliable. Here at Mondo Farms, irrigation has been part of our plans and our programs ever since we first established a crop of cabbage and cauliflower down on what is now known as Riverside One back in the winter of 2020. So over the years, as we've developed Winterthorn, we've had quite a lot of experience with different types of irrigation, and we know which one works for us for this type of crop and which one works for us for this type of crop. Speaking of vegetables, we're now developing the second farm, Kimberley, and part of our plans involve growing a large quantity of vegetables here. And for that, we will need a irrigation system. Should I say an irrigation system? <laughs> Part of that 
An irrigation system will involve somewhere to store the water. So if we go back in time, we look back to where we started. When we first created um, Riverside 2 and 3, we set up some plastic water tank that was able to supply our drip irrigation system. Then as the farm expanded and we opened up Westgate in, uh, that was November of 20, November, January of 21, we then soon realized that for the size and scope of vegetables that we had established there, the plastic water tanks just weren't going to cut it. This is because of size. The average size of your plastic water tank is 5,000 liters. And even at Westgate, when we put up that massive, massive structure, which had a 10,000 on top and then two fives on the side, it just couldn't supply enough water to the crops that we had there. And we started having some challenges. So by mid of 2021, we were looking for a way to store a larger amount of water. By the way, another important factor that we face when it comes to irrigating our crops is that the soils in the area where both of our farms are located is quite sandy. And as we all know, sandy soil doesn't store water very well and we have to apply a lot more water uh, to it. So you're always getting this type of story in farming. A farmer like us establishing a farm, you know, you plant so many crops and then realize that you don't have enough water storage for that. Yes, I really should have consulted an expert, but come on, come on, sometimes you just gotta go with it. And so there we were, it was mid of 21 and we had to find a way of storing a lot more water. There are many options when it comes to large water storage systems. And one of these, of course, is steel tanks. But when we looked into the price of the steel tanks, we realized that we just couldn't afford it. Our farm wasn't at that level and our finances were quite stretched. This is 21. Remember the pandemic. So we also then looked at concrete as an option. I did some research on the internet and I came up with this brilliant design. I took it to our structural engineer and I asked him to adapt and adopt it according to the size and the plan that we wanted and the location we were going to have. And he took it on and then we waited a week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks. It just couldn't happen. Now, this type of thing often happens in Zambia when you're dealing with people uh, that let you down. But here you've got the crop, you've got your vision uh, that you need, and we just had to keep moving. And then we started realizing that we needed to think outside the box. And as we were discussing different types of water storage systems, one day, Pethias had to attend a family funeral at his uncle's farm. And there they had this brilliant, beautiful water reservoir. And he took a video of it to share with us. The plastic you had there, Guamiran, yeah? So Guamiran, are you going plastic? So deep in the end of the body. So deep. Yeah. three meters deep. Four. Five meters in the deep. Then you move. Eighteen by eighteen. Eighteen by eighteen. Then you deep. Five meters. Five meters. Eighteen by five meters. So now we knew exactly what we had to build. Basically a very large fish pond. Our water reservoirs are very similar to the kind of um, water vessels that they use in aquaculture, which is fish farming, except that ours are much deeper. Normal fish ponds need to be shallow because of issues of light and oxygen and being able to catch the fish with nets when you're ready to harvest but ours need to be deeper because they need to have a lot of capacities. We've been able to build 
very large water reservoirs since we started doing these back in 21. We're talking about the one at Westgate, which is about 1.1 million liters. The one at Riverside One is about 1.3 million liters. And even our two smaller ones, the ones at um, Apex and the one at Riverside One, they're a couple of hundred thousand liters each. And those are quantities of water storage that we just wouldn't have been able to manage if we had continued to use plastic tanks. So as I'm sure you're beginning to see that the fish pond liner that we chose to use is a very important element in how we're able to make a hole in the ground to store water and then stop the water from being able to um, leak away. Remember I talked about our very sandy soils here in our area. Some people are able to make water reservoirs and then line them with clay or some other semi-permeable or impermeable material, asphalt and other things. But as I was doing my research, I realized that that was gonna be not only another learning thing that we needed to do on top of everything else that we're learning, but also another added cost. As I've been establishing the farms over the last couple of years, I've had to learn to manage the amount of learning there's been a lot of learning as I went from businessman into a farmer and started this, the farming journey. And there's also been a lot of costs as well. So some things you just have to look and say, cost A, ha -ha, cost B, okay, I think this one we can make a plan and we can manage. So I've been very glad that over the years we've chosen to go with the fish pond liner type of reservoir. And we've actually found it to be incredibly successful and incredibly, incredibly cost effective. What it costs us to make one of our um, fish pond liner water reservoirs is nothing compared to what it would have cost us to go with a steel option, maybe with a concrete option with all these challenges, and definitely not the plastic tank option. So now let's talk about this water reservoir that we've made here at Sungani. It is about five meters deep and 44 meters long by about 24 meters wide. Our expert has calculated that it can hold about 4 million liters of water. You'll notice that the sides are sloped at about 45 degrees. This is done with such structures in order to help hold the water and to resist the lateral pressures. So now we get into how we actually built a water reservoir like this one. It started with the planning way back as we were establishing uh, the layout of the farm itself. And we settled on this position um, at Sungani, which is basically in the middle of the farm. And it's going to be able to allow us to supply water to the various parts of it. As I'm sitting here, I look over that side and there's Kondwani, some fields that side, which we call Kondwani. Down below the reservoir is a place that we call Wezi. Over there behind the camera is a place that we call Taonga. And to my right is Chimwemwe. Yes, they're all Tumbuka names. This farm and all the fields in it were named in honor of our late Manda, who was a Nyamnyirenda. And as we're planning the reservoir, we knew that we wanted to have something big. We had done some relatively large reservoirs that you've seen at Winterthorne, but this one we wanted to be even bigger so that we would basically get, you know, one for the price of two with all the economies of scale. So we decided to make it 40 by 20. Appear. Now. Much it's still your baby. Yeah. <laughs> 
And then it's time to start making the hole in the ground. A long time ago, as we established in the farm, we realized that it is much quicker and cost effective in the long run to use earth moving equipment. There's a lot of different types of earth moving equipment, but there's one in particular that is commonly accessible around most of our towns and cities across Zambia, and I'm sure in other countries across Africa as well. It's called a TLB, which stands for, if I'm not correct, uh, let me remember, tractor loader bucket. A TLBs are quite medium size and they're very flexible in the work that they can do. And we were able to find a TLB that is now locally available here, very well priced, very polite and easy to deal with gentlemen. And best of all, the operators of the TLB have had quite a little bit of experience at making fish ponds, swimming pools, and other holes in the ground. So after we had talked to the guys, they came, they saw the site, they did estimates and stuff, and we agreed on the pricing, they were able to start coming to work, and the TLB arrived on site on Monday, March the 27th. Works have started and um, started making the the hole here, digging out. So slowly as the day progresses, um, our reservoir peat is taking shape. And uh, as of now, the depth is at uh, 1.5 as a uh, plant. Then over on the other side, we're leaving allowance for uh, shaping our 45 degree angle, which is the four meters. Then our dike is slowly being formed. Here we put our pegs. Slowly taking shape. Eh, the Pereka Oku, but Chetty from Kaiman's Zambongin. Then we want an outlet up, but you permit a paper space up. Eh, so Zakumba Ponachim Chim Goti, Popiti Sama Pipe, then Nepazan Karamunga Papungena Soko. Hm, Tai Kuma, a Pereka, could he dip Kukanyam Koka? So they think I straight to a manager, no Ganoka deep among them. Points you could not side. So Zakambati, a cat pay juvid up, who possessed a monga quanga mamba, then you can go down in Copangon. So Cate Bogangare, flat kuja, then a bonga slant kuno so. Then, but up, a pave up. Ibongara, Ibongara so. 
Pebunkari outlet. Hmm. So it means he was But not but sky semaning, demo mama could die. Hey, in front bucket, he say manga is a bad to say sa Ria Jaya. So as you saw there, it took a couple of days for a TLB to be able to dig the main hole in the ground and to establish the original uh, 20 meters wide by 40 meters dig deep hole. And then it was time to start working on the embankments on the sides. And this work begins with the TLB. He has to do the heavy lifting and he's moving earth around and also being able to go in and chisel the sides um, of the big hole in order to create the 45 degree angle that's required. Uh, so we're here in uh, the dig out area in the reservoir where we are measuring the, um, the height from, from above the ground. So, the upper scan is in that to 120. 120. So, this is the shallow side uh, where he's yet to come in and dig more. But before that, he's, uh, he's resorted into starting to shape in advance on this side so that he has less work going out. So, he'll shape from this side and he has um, access going out of uh, the reservoir. So she's going to shape and dig more here, then come on the other side. Then as he goes out, he digs out and going out. So this is uh, the part where it's uh, deep. From above ground, it's 1.6. And like I said, he's still digging out more. So let me get up on top so that you can have a better view. This is me now standing on top of uh, the dike, and there is our guy Joseph. So I would say it's a good uh, five meters going down. So it's now Saturday afternoon and the TLB has been excavating the reservoir since Monday 27th and uh, I'm anxious to see exactly how far they've gone. We're literally reaching the end now. So uh, as you know behind me, that's Chimwemwe, uh, beautiful uh, maize crop there and I'm walking through a little bit of a little bush that we have along this path and going to see uh, where the TLB is. And here it is, the uh, big reservoir. We literally are reaching the last phases now. Yes, it's big. It's a big reservoir. 20 uh, width by 40 along, should hold of over just over 2 million liters. And this is what we need to be able to farm effectively here at Kimru. We're now down at the back. Uh, I don't know what to call it, the bottom end. It would be the southwest corner. And we're going to see how and where 
we'll run our outlet, the bottom outlet. So here, he's going to dig out this thing and then give it to here. Yafka Pesa. Kutari Konso. Nifunsa. Okay, go ahead. It's because it's sloping. Okay. Wow. So near Pazankala tea. So the process of um, uh, digging and uh, shipping the reservoir is ongoing. Um, they're out of the, the main hole. We are done uh, levering the, the ground here. So what's left now is uh, shipping the dike. And this is what he's doing exactly. So he started on this side. As you can see how uh, level it is, how properly level it, level it is. So he's also shaping the top. Compacting on the sides, so it's gonna carry on starting on this side because this is the hardest part. So he's moving the soil, pushing it to the other side, so that he has a way of uh, shaping it properly and compacting it, which is basically what we need: uh, compaction by a machine. So it's going to take at least today to finish up this line and obviously start that line. Then tomorrow it's going to do the same on this side and on the other side. Then uh, I would say possibly Tuesday he shapes up and, uh, and finishes the polishing. So he's deliberately left this part because um, we're creating an outlet here that goes straight over there. Um, so far, this is the progress made in the reservoir in terms of um, shipping up the dike. This is our embankment. And um, she's done um, this side of the reservoir. Then coming up to this side, then to where I'm standing here. Then he's also leveled the inside here then tomorrow he continues starting from where joseph is standing then uh, all the way uh to the far end there so once the basic shape of the embankment had started to be established, we then had our guys move in and manually using their hand tools, they start smoothing the sides of the embankment. Their main job that they were doing was to remove any rocks or stones, as well as roots and branches from all the earth that had been moved. And we wanted the sides to be reasonably smooth so that they then don't puncture the plastic pond liner that we were about to put in. So there's the major works that the TLB is doing of uh, uh, making the, the dike and uh, things like picking up these logs 
uh, roots that were um, uh, left here after doing the stamping of the other trees. We come and manually remove them. So that is the next part uh, of uh, making reservoirs. He knows exactly what he's doing and how to do it. We are impressed by his works and uh, we're happy. So we also put a line that is guiding them in terms of the shaping. Um, finishing the day here at uh, uh, Sungani Reservoir. So we've done three sides. Now uh, we've done them entirely. Finished the wrecking and shaping. What's left is coming here tomorrow and, and remove those heaps of uh, gravel and stones that have been heaped up. So our only outlet for these is our outlet here. This drain here is our outlet. So the only part that's remaining with a whole lot of work, not too much, is where my two friends are standing, Morgan and uh, Mishek. So there's a depression where we need to patch up with uh, uh, soil that we're getting from where Nando Biggie is standing. So this will be done tomorrow. It will be finished tomorrow. So from here is the peg. There. And there's a depression, so we need to fill up with our soil to make it level, which we're chewing up this side. If not, push. Tremendous progress, and uh, we finish tomorrow before 12. So, we're here at the Sungani Reservoir um, where we're now digging the trench, but we're going to bury our pond line on the sides of the deck. So, the massy side. That's again the angle and reaching that angle they're now coming this side. They've already set the marker, the line and now they're coming digging. And inside there's a Zondo and David who are fine tuning, removing the bigger, bigger rocks on the ground just put the busy ga yeah to be to 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 so the shaping of the sides of the embankment was done and the smoothing by our guys was continuing and we reached the stage and we're happy that we were able to call in our consultant and have him come in and do all the final measurements. So 
We started with the 40 by 20 hole, right? And then we shaped the sides and we reached a certain height. So it took his special magic calculations. I'm not sure how exactly these guys do it, but he was able to measure this side, this side, this side, this side, this side, and come and tell us that we needed 176 meters of the pond liner. And just in time before the Easter break, we were able to go on Easter Thursday to uh, livestock services and to go and procure the pond liner. Let's talk about the pond liner, how and why we choose to buy our pond liner from livestock services. Mostly it's because they have a very quality pond liner that is very well priced. When we started researching the project, we looked at other local suppliers of the pond liner, and there was one in particular that had a mad price. A crazy price, your phone da. And we said, there's thousands of dollars per square meter per rod, 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 rod. Uh-uh, we can't do that. And after doing some research, um, we found that Livestock Services sells a very, very good quality uh, pond liner at a very good price. And of course, Livestock Services being a leading uh, provider of implements and inputs into the farming sector of Zambia is a place where you can always go back if there's a problem. The price was right and we were able to go. And the, there's a lot of cheaper sources of pond liner out there. But when you're making a massive piece of infrastructure that is integral to your farm, like these irrigation water reservoirs of ours, we don't take chances at this stage. I can save five kwacha today and end up losing a crop of this at a crucial time when they need water because the cheap li pond liner went and leaked and whatever it is. If you're building a farm, our advice is to build it with love and care and put in everything into, the, into having quality and reliable infrastructure at, um, from the very, very, very beginning. So at Livestock Services, we're there, we pay for the, uh, the pond liner, and now it time, starts time for cutting it. Oh my God, cutting 176 pond liner in four pieces, it took a while. And you know, one of the biggest problems is they have to wait for the cars to not be passing. So it's something that you kind of do later in the day because you know, Palapa area, Palapa, it's a busy place and it gets a bit hectic. So we're able to cut and fold the pond, liner, the pond liner in its very special way, as you will see later. And then they were able to load it onto the back of the truck. By the way, on the truck, we also had um, some rolls of 50 millimeter polypipe, another product that Livestock Services su uh, supplies. That was also another integral part of our irrigation system here at Kimberley. So all of this was loaded onto the back of our light truck and we were able to drive away just in time for Easter. So finally, we get to the exciting day of laying the pond liner, installing the pond liner. And this one we were able to do on Easter Saturday, April the 8th. This process of um, installing the pond liner, it's quite complex and it has quite a few steps that we're going to go into now. Let's start with the width of the pond liner. Your reservoir is 24 meters wide. There is no way we are going to buy a pond liner that's 24 meters wide. Let me just tell you that it's not possible. The pond liner everywhere comes from some factory in China or some other place in Southeast Asia. And it comes in, in widths of seven meters. So if you're going to achieve 24 meters, you need to join several pieces together. So there's a whole process that they do is where they bring in one pond liner, lay it out, and then they bring in the other ones in a special sequence, and then we start joining it together using a special machine.
Wazondo. Imamuna ma jumbo jumbo wena ngomzavu la podiako kwa tentai. Papa plastic. Recording is systematic, okay? Yeah. So that it's easy to, to unroll. So what we're doing right now, we're setting it up so that the guys um, can start joining the two um, pieces of uh, pond liner together. So they're setting up, uh, setting them up in such a way that they're on top of each other like this. <laughs> Okay. 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 So we have papika, na? Eh, then we have to go over the pipe and mamba. So the two pond liners are being joined together by this machine which is a heater.
Your guys teamwork. So we're now setting up and uh, we're starting to join our two onliners. And so the guy is moving with the machine. And uh, these guys are cleaning. They're cleaning the deck so that uh, we don't have any uh, problems in terms of the machine, leaving spaces in between. So once the joining of all the pond liner pieces has been together, you now have one chip big piece that the team then has to use all their strength and coordination to move it and position it across the width of the uh, reservoir in the best position possible. Um, so another step here is now uh, stretching it. Folding it. Very much more. Very much more. Very much more. Come here, I'm seeing Ah, I'm going to go to the house. I'm 
Sangai don't say ka. So when I was a rec, I will go to the side. Go now, go. So after the work of moving the pond line and positioning it as best as possible uh, one way, we then found that there was a little bit short, a few meters short on the eastern side and we needed a bit more pond liner. We can't go back to the shop. Ah, but we had some excess on the right hand side. I call it the right, it's actually the northern side if I use the four points of the compass. So we went in and we cut a little piece of that and we were able to join it onto the other eastern side. So now we're getting close to the end. We can actually see the finish line, but as with everything, you've got to do things properly. So before we can continue, the next thing the guys needed to do was to go back in and inspect all the joints. Remember, we had four pieces that we then had to put together in that special way. And they had to go back and make sure that everything was okay in terms of the joining and make sure that there was no holes or no tears because these things happen. Did you see the size of that thing? As the guys were pushing and pulling and pushing and pulling, yeah. You do tend to get a couple of accidents. So the next job is to go back in, check it out, and then seal any holes to make it watertight. So we're now making a chain because um, the plastic uh, or the pond liner is slippery. So he's the one with the gun patching up and uh, the rest of the guys are giving him support. Again, for hitting a situ hitting a chip and one bar, you should come on by days up here. My hippies come kind of come in some cuts so that my plastic can cook your both sides. I can cook a cut in the middle of my mamma, so that I can be a shoe. I own side in the mamma. So it's now late morning, everybody's tired. It's been a heavy morning of pushing and pulling this massive beast weighing many kilograms up and down across the, res the reservoir and everything. The final part of the process is to hold the reservoir in place, to fix it in place, right? And we do that by actually that trench that you saw dug on the sides along the top of the uh, embankment, we then bury the ends of the pond liner into that. And that's a lot of work and takes a little bit of time.
So finally, we have a vessel that's going to behold millions and millions of liters of water. But we need that water, not here eventually, but out in the fields irrigating our crops. How do we get the water out of the reservoir? There are two systems. The first one, very obvious, we use pumps. So we put pumps on the side and then we're able to pump out the water and go and... And the second method is one that we devised ourselves. I'm very proud of this innovation. We are innovative people here at Mundo Farms. We look at some of the fields that are below some of the fields, especially that we're using drip irrigation for, we don't need to pump the water out if we can get the water to flow out of the reservoir. So as we were constructing, you saw that part where we left a space and, you know, on the sides for what we call the outlet. It's one of the words we use here on the farm, the outlet. So we make a side and then at the bottom of the reservoir, we're going to put a special type of hole and then have water flow out of that. At Riverview, it's got up to about 10, 12 meters above the level of the, of the rest of the farm. And we've been able to achieve massive, massive pressures there. Enough to drive a pop-up sprinkler and a rain hose, if you can imagine, without a booster pump. So part of the last jobs that we did in the days following the uh, installation of the pond liner was to come back in and install the outlets. Pushing on, pushing on, pushing. Um, so we have our guy now, Morgan, who is doing the cleaning of the sand and the gravel that was falling into the reservoir. And we've opened what is now flowing into the reservoir. So this whole idea of putting water here is to check before we bury the, um, the outlet drainage. Before we bury it, we check if there is any leakage or not, because it's going to be permanent and we don't have, want to have issues where we bury, then it's leaking. So here we've got a good discharge. That's from 700 meters away from the main source of water. This is a very, very good discharge. So, as we planned, we want water, we want this to be the steeper side, and it is the steeper side where water settles. And uh, there is our outlet. <laughs> this is a good thing to see. And finally, after the plumbing part had been done, the last part of the job in installing the outlet is to close the gap. They need to go back in and backfill that area. They do it in a certain way that they're still able from time to time, if necessary, that we can go back in there and be able to do some more works there because that is a plumbing thing and plumbing must always be accessible one way or another. <laughs> Outreach. 
So finally, we're at the stage of having a complete water reservoir. And under normal circumstances, we would start celebrating. No, no, no. There's two final steps that need to be done. And this is to protect, first of all, the reservoir and also to protect ourselves and our loved ones. The first one involves planting grass along the sides of the embankment. And the reason we do this is that the roots of the grass then hold the embankment in place. You can imagine uh, where and tear wind and rain would start to eat away at the reservoir. So we normally try to plant grass along the sides of the reservoir. It takes a little bit of time and is actually quite difficult to do and sometimes involves bringing in doti, inangu doti, not this gravel that you have, but in other different types of doti that can be used. The second level of protection involves fencing around the reservoir. Now, a water reservoir like this is something that is very attractive to naughty children and stray animals, you know, at certain times. You can imagine it's October and the youngsters of the neighborhood, they are around the farm say, and next thing they are falling in this five meter thing, they can't swim at that level. And uh, we have that word which we call Ngozi and there's all sorts of issues. So we need to be able to protect it similarly, protect them access, you know, restrict access to the dam from animals. Because the last thing we want is a thirsty goat going in there and going and falling in there and then rotting and then contaminating our water and stuff. So as you can see here, our reservoirs at Winterthorn have all been fenced off to protect and there's gates and locks and stuff and you can't get there easily. As you're establishing a farm, putting down major infrastructure like this is really important. I appreciate that the size and scope of what we do here at Mondo Farms is something that not everybody is able to do. But your first water reservoir, if we use our example, may not be this big. It'll be the size that's adequate for the type of crops that you're growing on your farm. And I'm really proud and glad to be able to stand here as an example of how, you know, within a couple of years, we've reached the stage of being able to have this type of infrastructure that makes a difference on the farm. Our farm started um, a couple of years ago and we were only able to grow crops during the rainy season. We chose irrigation and now we're able to say, yeah, we can grow crops during the year and also grow crops as and when the weather patterns become increasingly unreliable and unpredictable. So there you have it, the water reservoir is in place. I am very happy, as they say in Zimbabwe, happy. And in Zambia, they would go, it's a major, 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 major achievement for us to have put down this piece of infrastructure because it forms the backbone of our irrigation system. It allows us to be able to apply water to our crops as and when they are needed. So we're already using it. We've got the irrigation of our crops, uh, the maize crop that's on Chimwemwe and on Tawonga. And very soon, we're getting started with vegetable production with our first crop. I think it's baby marrow. That's going to be down on Konwani 1A. We're just getting things ready for that. Hopefully, I'll be able to share the story of that crop and how we finish the, 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 the maize crop here on another video on the channel soon. You want to see it? Then subscribe. Press the subscribe button. 
And if you press the bell icon, ding, then YouTube will notify you of when another video comes along. I used to say that a video is every week to 10 days, but work is just, you know, reached another level, day jobs and other responsibilities and things. And also the quality of production that we're doing with our videos is, has gone slightly higher. So they take me quite a lot longer for me to edit and produce them. So they won't be coming as fast and furious as they used to. And we're gone for quality rather than quantity. But I really appreciate having all the people that regularly get in touch with us uh, through the comments and give us their feedback. And also, I appreciate an opportunity to be able to share our farming journey um, here as we continue to um, establish these two farms on the outskirts of Chongwe. There's people out there that you would like perhaps to share this video with, so you could um, press the share button and then, you know, put the details in into the YouTube system. Or maybe via WhatsApp or Facebook, you share this video with them. If you like the video, then please give it a thumbs up. My name is Chesha Folotia. Shalemipo. Bye-bye.